afternoon now um, that uh, the sun is over the yard arm. Um, welcome to uh, Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute Ottawa branch meeting. Uh, my name is Jeff Longadoc and I'm the executive director of CASI. So it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome everybody to this November meeting of the Ottawa branch of CASI. This is a lunch and learn meeting um, in a sense. I hope you can all enjoy some lunch and some learning too. Uh, today really is what gives it this uh, characterization. Uh, we're hoping that this is a good time for a lot of people to be free for about an hour. And uh, so that's the reason why we're scheduling this meeting at this time. Um, so I'm glad you could all make it. Um, your host today for today's meeting as would normally be the case uh, for an Ottawa branch meeting is Omer Majid. Uh, Omer is co-chair of the Ottawa branch and he's served in this volunteer capacity since 2010. So it's hard to believe it's been a decade. Um, and uh, we're extremely grateful to Omer for his sustained support of the Institute and his inspired leadership of the branch. And, and part of the inspiration that he brings to the branch meetings is that um, well, first of all, he's been practicing aerospace engineering for over 20 years. Uh, and along the way he's earned his bachelor, prior to that he earned his bachelor's and his master's of aerospace engineering uh, from Carleton. Um, he currently works, as he mentioned, uh, actually he didn't mention it while well, you folks were on the line, but um, in our earlier conversation, um, he works now for MDS Aero Support Corporation but in addition to that, he's the owner of Specific Range Solutions Limited, which is a company he launched in 2008. And he also holds a Transport Canada commercial pilot's license. So um, he's an accomplished person already. Uh, and, and we're very grateful for Omer to be part of the Ottawa branch as he has been for so long. Um, so Omer, uh, it's over to you now to introduce today's speakers, Jeremy Laliberté, and J.R. Hammond. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the, the kind introduction and uh, welcome uh, everyone who's joining online to our uh, Lunch and Learn. And um, yeah, so I will, uh, I will start off with the um, introduction of, of uh, uh, Professor Jeremy Laliberté, who will be our first speaker. So he's a professor at um, the Department of uh, Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering here at Carleton University in Ottawa. And uh, he has uh, numerous uh, research interests, um, but his uh, focus is on novel aircraft structures, composite materials and hybrids, and the next generation of air vehicle concepts, uh, UAVs and uh, MAVs. And uh, he has most recently worked on a project uh, related to fiber metal laminate, uh, FML processing, uh, micro uh, aerial vehicle uh, structures, and the qualification of primarily uh, composite airframe structures. And and I've heard uh, uh, Professor Lali Berté on uh, on CBC uh, at, at least once in the in the last couple of months. So uh, he's uh, he's definitely a, uh, a growing public figure. Uh, our second uh, speaker um, will be uh, J.R. Hammond, who is the uh, executive director of the not-for-profit Canadian Advanced Air Mobility Consortium. Uh, the consortium specializes in creating the marketplace for advanced air mobility in Canada. Uh, it's a diverse group of stakeholders uh, that are centralized on the triple bottom line, environmental, social and economic integration of advanced air mobility, including electric and hydrogen vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, um, electric and hydrogen short takeoff and landing aircraft, and as well, uh, electric and hydrogen conventional takeoff and landing aircraft. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to pass the uh, present presentation uh, uh, and spotlight uh, on to uh, Jeremy Lillibert. Thank you, Omer, and uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to, to uh, present today. I'm going to share my screen here and uh, 
Hopefully this uh, works all right. You know, if uh, I don't know if you can see that yet, one second here. There we go. All right, is everybody able to see that? All right, no issues there. Um, again, um, my name is Jeremy Letty Belte, as, uh, as Omar mentioned. Um, I'm a professor at Carleton University uh, in, uh, in Ottawa. Um, and uh, I've been running our uh, one of our capstone design projects for a number of years um, since I came to Carleton. Uh, many of you may know uh, Professor Paul Strasnicki, who was uh, uh, my my graduate supervisor uh, at Carleton. And um, uh, Professor Strasnicki brought the the capstone concept to Carleton. What I'm going to talk about today is is an introduction to. Um, our new topic this year, which is an advanced air mobility uh, design project, partially in response to um, the issues of the, the pandemic and, and uh, moving to remote teaching, but also as, as a new um, initiative at the university to basically introduce a new topic. As, as many folks know, we've been working on UAVs uh, for a long time and, and uh, we're bringing back in some of the, um, the passenger focused uh, aircraft design. So um, not a highly technical presentation, but I'm going to give a little bit of a history of our projects at Carleton, a little walk down memory lane. I know uh, from looking at the uh, the attendance list, there's some former students uh, and other folks who've been involved in, in these capstone projects. So you may recognize uh, some of the topics. Um, what we had to do in response to the pandemic in, in terms of um, uh, switching gears and uh, and responding to that both in March under the kind of immediate emergency and now for this academic year. Um, and what we're proposing, which is a, a, a Canadian advanced air mobility design competition, basically uh, a challenge for not just students at Carleton, but other universities as well. Uh, a little bit of our progress to date, a couple of um, images from some of this from the current students and what uh, we see as future plans uh, for this. So a little bit of history, as I mentioned, uh, these these projects were brought to Carleton or introduced at Carleton uh, when we brought in our uh, Bachelor of Aerospace Engineering, uh, which started in in 1988 and our first graduating class was in uh, 1992. And our very first capstone project topic was actually a, a UAV or an RPV for fire spotting for the uh, Quebec uh, forest fire service uh, purely a a paper project they, they didn't build uh, prototypes uh, this was modeled on the cranfield university uh, graduate design project um, uh, model and eventually the this format was adopted across the entire department so um, in the uh, uh, late 90s early 2000s we started to uh, move this format to other topics such as the formula sae uh, low emission gas turbine for, for power generation and co-generation and many other topics. So we have everything from uh, crash test dummies and high efficiency housing to um, other types of uh, UAVs like blended wing aircraft, as well as uh, ground vehicles, autonomous cars, uh, and so on. So it's quite a number of, of, um, of topics. And this model uh, has been adopted at a few other universities as well. Um, uh, you know, and we've had we've hosted visitors to learn about our approach to these capstone projects. So uh, in the in the 90s, this was primarily a paper, uh, paper type projects. Um, there was some hands on work and you can see in the slide here a couple of images, actually from my year in 1990. 97, uh, 96, 97, we were designing a, a business jet, a small business jet, and uh, we had some students from industrial design as part of our team looking at human factors, and they actually built a, a full-size uh, cockpit and forward cabin model, which you could actually walk into, and, and um, I say paper design because most of it was actually built out of cardboard and, and wood for the most part, um, with the uh, cockpit seats taken from one of my, my fellow students uh, from their car, actually, uh, to use for this. So, But this was um, where we started to get into more of the experiential uh, learning opportunities. And so through the 90s, the, the majority of the projects were, were single year uh, passenger type aircraft. Um, oh, um, seeing an overview of the presentation, not my slides. Oh, 
screen. Okay, that's a share screen issue. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. Really sorry about that. How about now? Okay. Uh, good. All right. Sorry about that. I should know better, but like I said earlier too, in our uh, uh, briefing at the beginning, we don't use Zoom very much for teaching. Honestly, we use Microsoft Teams and a few other tools. So, um, and as I was saying, so you can see on the slide here, um, we've got uh, a full size mock up of the uh, uh, of the business jet that was designed and built uh, by the uh, our team that year. Um, and we've had a number of other passenger or cargo type aircraft. Uh, we also saw at this time the introduction of a very interdisciplinary uh, approach where we had students from other departments like electronics, systems, industrial design, and, and software, but still primarily uh, an aerospace and mechanical uh, type of project. And then through the, the early 2000s and, and, and up to uh, this past year, um, Professor Stresnicki and, and other faculty members, and this is before I joined Carleton, uh, they decided to introduce uh, UAVs or UAS to the, to the project as an opportunity to move to a design, build, fly uh, type of approach. So basically um, designing and building aircraft over multiple years. And so this included uh, the Hammerhead, which was um, for Transport Canada's uh, uh, sur uh, aircraft surveillance program, looking at uh, ice flow and uh, looking at um, illegal bilge dumping from, from fishing vessels and cargo vessels. We had the GeoServe um, 1 and 2, and, and the GeoServe 2 was uh, still running up until last year. Of course, with the pandemic, we've had to, to stop work on that. Um, so these are various forms of um, uh, remote sensing type of platforms. And then we also started to introduce other uh, topics topics, often uh, for one or two years, just to make sure that we had not only uh, students building and flying aircraft, but also the opportunity for them to work on conceptual design and preliminary design. And so we had a range of, of various UAVs, uh, some of which were built and flown, others uh, uh, didn't leave the lab. And then um, in 2016, we actually introduced uh, back uh, a passenger type of aircraft, a low emission uh, light sport aircraft. And in 2018, we introduced a gyroplane. So to bring in uh, more of the rotary wing uh, elements to things. So it's a little bit of a history. Um, and then in March, uh, 2020, of course, along with everyone else um, on Friday, uh, March 13th, the university basically announced that uh, everything was moving online. We'd already had a bit of a heads up on this. Uh, there'd been internal discussions for a couple of weeks about moving to remote teaching. So really the focus there for those last few weeks was just to get through the term um, and, and help the students wrap up uh, their term work. And they'd been working on a number of um, aircraft, some uh, quad and tricopter uh, UAVs, as well as the GeoServe. Um, we had planned actually to go out on March 13th to do some flight testing, and uh, we had to put the brakes on everything. And our, our normal winter design review, which I know many of you have attended in the past uh, and participated as uh, reviewers and guests, uh, moved on to Zoom. And uh, so we were still able to hold a review of sorts, but it was, of course, nothing like the, the uh, normal in-person uh, review. So uh, this led to a summer of planning, essentially, and our university uh, uh, planning group for COVID uh, basically announced in May that the fall term would be online. Uh, no on-campus camp no on -campus labs. Um, we knew that students would be scattered uh, around the world and around the country. And so we really had to ensure that students could have um, access to the resources they would need. Uh, we had to look at issues such as students in, in, in parts of the world where uh, the internet access is controlled by governments. So how do we ensure that um, you know, they can get uh, VPNs and other ways to access materials uh, and so on. So lots of issues uh, arose, which um, Carleton and other universities really uh, worked on over the summer. And basically we have a number of tools and I know many of you are familiar with these uh, from your own uh, remote work experience as well. Uh, so Microsoft Teams is, is, is a big one for us. And as it turned out, uh, my project uh, last year was part of a pilot to test Microsoft Teams for capstone projects at Carleton uh, back in September of 2019 before the pandemic. So essentially once we had to move remote, uh, we were we were pretty well set up on that. Um, and then Carleton has a number of other tools. Uh, we have a, a heavy investment in, in virtual desktop and remote desktop uh, infrastructure uh, so that students can access 
uh, tools like Katia, MathCAD, MATLAB, and other tools um, at home. Uh, even if they're not running Windows, they can log in and, and access uh, those tools as well. And then um, for a number of our projects, um, we are making available hardware kits and, and doing 3D printing through our workshop uh, without the students actually, of course, coming to campus. But we are sending out hardware and things like that uh, as needed. So uh, that's stuff that's being used to support um, all of our projects. So for this capstone project, what uh, we decided to do is return to the roots of our, some of our early um, uh, capstone projects, look at a single topic. So one topic for the whole team and focused on a passenger uh, uh, centric aircraft for Canadian applications with an emphasis on, on the, the conceptual and preliminary design process for the aircraft. Um, we also know of the challenges of leading large teams remotely so uh, although we would take our normal number of students, which is about 30 students on the team, we would still subdivide them into smaller teams and, and basically set up uh, an in-house competition of sorts uh, with a real emphasis on modeling and simulation and, and robust uh, you know, work on the fundamentals. In the summer, we were still looking at the possibility of getting back into the labs uh, for winter 2021. But right now, obviously, with the way the numbers are going, I think that's uh, very unlikely. And even if we did uh, bring back any lab work, it would be very much uh, uh, optional and voluntary. So the challenge we decided to set for the students, and this was uh, after some consultation that I, that I had with industry and with, with uh, some folks uh, such as NRC's uh, Aerospace Research Center uh, and some, some uh, industry folks, um, we decided to develop a, a Made in Canada Advanced Air Mobility uh, Aircraft Design Challenge uh, for the students with a focus on, on missions that would be relevant to, to Canada, uh, as well as low emissions or zero emissions, um, including both noise and greenhouse gas emissions. And then other considerations in our RFP that we developed for this project uh, was to have uh, health monitoring of the aircraft, you know, considerations for end of life uh, of the aircraft and accessibility for the cabin uh, to ensure that, that folks with limited mobility can, can access the aircraft. Um, and some of the performance requirements that we set are based on NRC's uh, integrated autonomous uh, mobility initiative. And so we have three missions that were set uh, for this uh, under this uh, design challenge. One is a standard mission with a pilot and four passengers. We have an aeromedical uh, patient transport mission, uh, not a medevac mission, but, but patient transfer, and then a cargo mission as well uh, with standard uh, North American uh, pallet, uh, palletized cargo uh, the students are looking at. And the, the graphic here is just a, a map of Canada with those 300 uh, kilometer range circles uh, you know, at major airports uh, throughout Southern and Northern Canada. So you can get an idea of, of where you could reach um, with this nominal range um, for this uh, aircraft. And so the, the team that we have, we've got uh, three uh, faculty members uh, uh, as lead engineers. And then we have uh, former students and retired uh, industry and government professionals uh, also working as, as lead engineers and advisors, uh, graduate student teaching assistant. Uh, and then we've got 33 students uh, this year from aerospace, mechanical and electrical engineering. Uh, so we have a, a quite a good uh, large cohort from electrical engineering. Um, and we've divided them into three teams to basically compete uh, internally on this on this project. Uh, and so far things are going quite well. We had our we have regular meetings as a group as well as uh, smaller group meetings. And um, students are coming up with, with lots of uh, creative designs. Um, they're going through that um, conceptual design phase right now, looking at the sizing of the aircraft. Uh, doing trade studies and mission analysis. Um, and of course, uh, as, as with anything, uh, going back to our RFP and, and challenging some of the requirements, and, and uh, which is good because it allows us to fine tune things. Um, and now uh, this term, late this term and into next term, we're going to get into uh, design work uh, of the system, you know, various subsystems and components uh, of the aircraft. And you can see on the slide here, some of the, the early concept sketches that we've got uh, from some of the students. So. You know, despite working remotely, I think we're still able to get um, quite a bit of, uh, you know, the, the, um, the experience that we normally have with these projects uh, with this, uh, this year. And so the future vision, what, what I'd like to do and what I'd like to see is, is develop this into a national design competition. That, that's my, my ultimate vision uh, for this, modeled on um, AIAA and the Royal Aeronautical Society competitions, um, possibly even going to a design build fly. I think this would be a really amazing challenge for, for students across the country if uh, we set this up as a, uh, a design build fly uh, type competition. 
competition um, and, and open it up to, you know, all other uh, Canadian universities and colleges. Um, and I think there's a really good opportunity here. Um, we've already had some great contributions uh, from, from NRC and folks at Cassie and, and CAM as well um, to help with the, uh, what we're doing at Carleton. But I think really, I'd really like to see this uh, maybe expanded uh, across the country. Um, and just some acknowledgements. These are some of the folks who've contributed to the initial RFP uh, from industry and from Cassie, uh, Carlton and NRC. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer questions um, before, I don't know, uh, Omer, if we're doing questions now or uh, if you wanted to go to the other presentation, um, entirely up to you. Yeah, um, I'll, uh, I'll ask right now um, if anyone does have a question regarding um, Jeremy Laliberte's uh, presentation, um, certainly um, can entertain them um, right now. Um, otherwise, um, we can pass uh, right to um, right to JR to have his presentation. So there certainly will be a chance at the end uh, for, for questions, whether they related to your presentation, Jeremy, or James. And, and just a note, if, um, uh, yeah, for the RFP um, that we've developed, if anyone is interested in that, I'm happy to share it um, with other universities, other, you know, colleges that are maybe interested in looking at this as a basis for, for their own projects. Um, I see a question in the chat about um, open to other universities. Uh, for 2021, um, that would be, I think the timing would work well for that if, um, if, if, uh, uh, we wanted to aim for a September uh, 2021 kickoff for this. Um, I've already had uh, one other university in, in Western Canada that's asked about using it for their own um, uh, capstone projects starting in January. I know some universities work on a January start rather than a September start for their capstone. Um, but uh, that would be my vision, uh, yeah, would be to go for a September 2021, uh, if at all possible. Okay, very good. Um, so let's uh, let's pass then uh, the ball over to uh, to Jr. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy, for your presentation and that uh, that summary. And just a personal note, uh, I was in the first graduating aerospace class back in '92. So uh, yeah, uh, we did the UAV capstone project for uh, for firefighting. Uh, I, I so. still have your reports from that year, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah eons ago when the when the hills were mountains so uh jr um thank you for um for your uh decision to participate and uh, yeah very much looking forward to your um your canadian advanced air mobility initiative presentation so please take it away well thank you so much omar and i just want to express gratitude to jeff april todd and the entire cassie team for the opportunity to speak here this morning as well to the incredible jeremy for giving us that introduction on the great work being done at carleton university and how we continue to lean to those collaborations so good morning everyone i'm saying a nice sunny morning from here in vancouver british columbia which is uh showcasing our initial slide here and beyond privileged to have the opportunity to speak to the Cassie Group and specifically the Ottawa branch at this Lunch and Learn today. Today's conversation is going to be a little bit of an overview of the Canadian Advanced Air Mobility Consortium, CAM, which is better known, and really moves forward to the exciting pieces that we're trying to go forward on the next opportunities with this technology. We want to begin and acknowledge that I am broadcasting from the unceded and traditional ancestral territories of the Coast Salish people of the Squamish, Musqueam, Quetlam, Katsi, and Sinohomi nations. And we continue to honor our responsibility in recognizing the duty for reconciliation we have within CAM and our ecosystem to further curate the harmonizing of indigenous wisdom into the equitable and inclusive use of our air resources, specifically when it comes to advanced air mobility. So today I would like to take a moment to introduce myself and bring light to the uh, exciting work that we're progressing at CAM. My name is J.R. Hammond and I'm the executive director for CAM, the Canadian Advanced Air Mobility Consortium, our federal not-for-profit consortium 
based initially here in Vancouver, British Columbia, but with the federal mandate to develop the marketplace and ecosystem for strategizing the optimal advanced air mobility integration into our Canadian context. Over the past week, we've had the pleasure to announce our, our global launch event with really showcase the last year and a half of work of bringing the involvement, collaboration domestically and internationally on furthering the advanced air mobility vision that we have for the future. CAM, or the Canadian Advanced Air Mobility Consortium, is really focused on developing out that ecosystem for the movement of goods, people, and services in both the urban and rural areas. And our vision at CAM is to be the exclusive national consortia for advanced air mobility, bringing together those diverse stakeholders from industry, academia, investors, municipal, provincial, and federal governments, as well critically the public voice in developing out that marketplace for advanced air mobility in Canada. Now we're privileged, privileged to have the opportunity to have created CAM, which is a spin-off from the company Canadian Air Mobility, which is focused on in activist AAM environmental and social investments. Since then, the federal not-for-profit has developed in order to house the ecosystem and ensure a tangible framework that is transitioned across the country. You can find any additional information on the newly launched website, canadianaam.com, or reach out to us at the info at canadianaam.com at email address. Now, one of the key pieces of developing up this new tangible industry is focusing on developing the framework that can be transferred across the country. This framework specifically builds upon the foundational goal of progressing advanced air mobility as a positive step forward for society and not designed specifically for one section of the socioeconomic spectrum. Our foundation framework that we define as the Advanced Air Mobility Index ensures that advanced air mobility must be equitable, inclusive, resilient, intermodal, accessible, and foundationally based upon the integration of zero emission aircrafts, knowing that our conversation since day one with both cities, municipalities, and provinces have declared that any integration of this technology must continue to improve upon their sustainability goals in moving to the uh, actions against climate change. Now, intertwined in all of these six aspects creating the foundational framework is that of safety. We know that the, the essence of safety cannot be compromised at all with any integration of this new technology. And we continue to build upon the incredible work done by Transport Canada and NAV Canada at the National ANSP to ensure we build upon those aviation standards and continue to have the opportunity to improve upon them with this new advanced air mobility technology. Now, in order to facilitate some of the ideas behind AAM, we'll share this brief video from Charles Alcock of the Aviation International News, highlighting the urban air mobility aspect and potential, and specifically highlighting some of our work in the Vancouver and British Columbia region. Pioneers of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft say that the 2020s will be the decade when the much-hyped urban air mobility revolution becomes a reality. According to research by Nexra advisors, across 75 leading cities worldwide, up to $318 billion will be spent on urban air mobility between 2020 and 2040. The company, which advises aerospace and transportation investors, believes that as many as 28,000 EVATOL aircraft will enter service over the next 20 years. We think that certain cities can actually begin to absorb and uh, operate electric uh, vertical takeoff aircraft as soon as they're available and certified. That could be as early as next year. Um, uh, it's not, this is not just a U.S. game. There are other countries that are uh, anxious to uh, have vehicles certified and put into operation.
far more quickly than the dates or deadlines that you're hearing from regulators or for that matter from some of the industry spokespeople from Uber or elsewhere. So I'll give you an example, a very good example of Vancouver in British Columbia. Vancouver is a water city. The city itself is surrounded by water on three sides. It has a vibrant, profitable helicopter charter sector and NAV Canada is anxious to uh, begin providing air traffic services for piloted vehicles as soon as they uh, become available and put into operation. So that could be, that could be next year. Now this gives us some context of where we're progressing in the future, not only for developing out a framework for British Columbia, but to ensure those learnings are transferred and applied nationwide. When we bring this to a macro level to really understand where CAM has its area of focus, we look to the left-hand side of our screen at the incredible work that has been done in the drone or UAS industry over the past decade and a half, building a platform of technology, opportunities, and critically connections with regulators to ensure that as AAM develops out, all those learnings and continued partnerships bridge into the applicability of advanced air mobility. In our center of the screen, we really focused on two aspects that fall under the AAM framework. We want to ensure that we have the inclusivity behind the urban air mobility side, unlocking the dense areas around our cities and some of our surrounding neighborhoods. And then critically as well, the regional air mobility aspect. How are we understanding a different connectivity piece, be it on an air metro or some of our regional air operators, to ensure that AAM has the benefit for them as well? The three different mission and use cases that we identify as we look at different uh, platforms for the aircraft, that of the vertical takeoff and landing side, unlocking those dense areas above our cities, short takeoff and landing, identifying the general aviation airport and existing airport infrastructure throughout Canada, and then to, lastly, on our largest block there, the conventional takeoff and landing, ensuring that we have an inclusive terminology for all of our larger airport infrastructure nationwide. But critical to that black box where we focus on our area of, on our area of understanding is that of the zero emission operation. We're setting the bar as high as we can at the start to ensure that the technology and its integration process continues to be improved upon. Now, as we develop out and progress this area of focus for AAM on that center side of the screen, the goal is to continue to transition the learnings and build and connect with the commercial aviation industry as the battery opportunities, the hydrogen fuel cell opportunities continue to expand and grow. And it gives us the ability to carry larger amounts of passengers and more cargo opportunities. When we focus on these three business areas, the lines that have been identified are that of the passenger service, the air services, and that of cargo. We know the opportunity that comes out of all of these. And what we're focusing on is bringing together the, the diverse group of stakeholders, speaking about the industry, academia, national regulators and research, three levels of government and investors to start identifying those revenue generating use cases as a starting point for figuratively and literally getting this industry off the ground. This is a small representation of our initial collaboration here in the British Columbia side, but relevant for our conversations today, the continued expansion out east, specifically in the Ontario and Quebec regions, are where we're benefiting from on having a lot of these stakeholders and consortium members representing locations in Ontario and Quebec at the same time. What we have been focusing on in the Vancouver aspect as a starting point for the rest of the country is laying out this 2040 roadmap on how advanced air mobility could be applied in the Vancouver context. Our initial white paper highlights the various use cases, different opportunities from the passenger, cargo and air services side, and really showcases to, to the city, to the public and to the province where the technology could be applied. As we continue to expand on the roadmap, the critical piece to support this development is the conversation similar to today, based upon the growing and awareness and education of the air mobility ecosystem. We know that the implementation of this technology will not occur in silo. So by providing transparent exposure and continuing to raise awareness of the potentials 
of advanced air mobility, we see that use cases will grow and that operations can be more optimally introduced in line instead of against existing goals set out by cities and additional stakeholders. When we talk about Vancouver as a starting point and really a petri dish for this technology, there are three foundational ingredients that have leveraged this city as a starting point for AAM, but really to take those learnings and expand it to areas like the Ottawa markets, like the Toronto side, and critically Montreal as well. The sustainability, operational excellence of having the world's largest scheduled helicopter service on the planet, that of Helijet International, based in downtown Vancouver. And lastly, the geography and ecosystem ensuring that we can reduce the noise and visual pollution of any of these uh, advanced air mobility platforms by funneling the traffic routes over the waterways and away from people gives us an opportunity to have a higher social integration piece as we look as Vancouver at that initial air mobility catalyst. Now, building on how we actually move into a starting point on identifying these use cases, over the past year, we've identified one critical use case on the cancer isotope movement from Vancouver's General Hospital to that of Victoria's Royal Jubilee Hospital as a tangible, social, socially beneficial and sustainable operation to bring in an electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. Now this framework built upon what we have defined as that triple bottom line analysis, ensuring there is equal parts put on the economic, environmental, and social aspects of these operations. We've recruited some of the top experts around the world to help facilitate these feasibility and operation studies and have really spent the time on identifying this cancer isotope use case in comparing where conventional ground transportation as showed in the number one example here to that of where Helijet is currently transporting these isotopes using their Sikorsky S-76 helicopter from their downtown heliport in Vancouver to the downtown heliport in Victoria. And lastly, showcasing to the public and critically the province who is paying the bill for this tra logistic transportation on that number three example of bringing in an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft and moving these isotopes from hospital direct to hospital, meaning a more efficient and quicker operation time, that of a zero emission aircraft meaning less time spent in logistics, more cancer patients treated, and less of the cancer isotopes having to be produced overall. For those uh, not familiar with our West Coast geography, on our red star near Hapa here in Vancouver is where the conventional Jan Vancouver General Hospital is located. And these cancer isotopes that treat cancer patients are required to be used in Victoria's Royal Jubilee Hospital, located at the red star at the bottom of the screen. As you will note, we have the Strait of Georgia in between here that provides a complex ground operation, hence an air-to-air -air solution really gives us the opportunity to lean into these, these use cases for the societal benefit. As we look forward to our strategic action plan for 2021, we have completed the initial triple bottom line feasibility study on this initial Vancouver AAM operation. And now we are moving forward to identifying these demonstration and critically the operational flights. We've set our fundraising goal of around 2 million Canadian, identified additional federal and provincial grants to match any dollars coming in. In order to work with NAV Canada and Transport Canada in conjunction with our members on developing out the systems architecture and con ops for an integrated operation of these cancer isotope transportation cases. Similarly, we want to ensure that this framework on all of this system architecture is not siloed just to the cancer isotope case, but allowing for near-term revenue generating use cases to be stacked upon them. The critical aspects of COVID-19 use cases, additional time sensitive logistics, or that of the delivering of vaccines once we enter the vaccination stage, specifically for the remote rural, rural locations in British Columbia and across the country. And to conclude, we know that Canada represents, yes, an opportunity for bringing in the advanced air mobility technology, but it's building upon existing platforms worldwide that gives us the opportunity to create partnerships, shared learning, 
and advance our own understanding of where and how this technology can be applied. From the West Coast, some of the initial developments are building upon the Cascadia Corridor or linking a stronger linkage of the cities of Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, and Vancouver, British Columbia. The terminology that is built upon is understanding that the strong links of some of the largest tech companies in the world, be it Boeing, Nike, Intel, Amazon, Microsoft, within the Cascadia region, give the opportunity for moving sustainable people, goods, and services between the cities of Vancouver, Seattle, and Portland. This conversation can then be applied to the Golden Triangle out east, connected into the New York markets, the different Washington, Boston, uh, New York, and Philadelphia side, and showcasing how that 300 kilometer range, as Jeremy so eloquently out spoke about in his presentation, on providing new connectivity opportunities, specifically in that regional air mobility market. On a larger scale, building partnerships such as the Nordic Network for Electric Aviation, which has painted a beautiful roadmap for the Nordic countries on moving to zero emission aviation by 2040, bringing together the airlines, airport operators, and specifically the regulators of the Nordic countries on sharing those learnings, building them here in Canada, and having the opportunity for legislatures to not start from ground zero, but create a platform that has been developed and showcased in the Nordic countries and apply those learnings within the Canadian context. And lastly, our next steps. Today is really an invitation to bring advanced air mobility as we sit here in 2020 to Canada and make it a reality. This is our call to action to you, the ecosystem, the public and the informed aviation community and really sending an invitation to leaning into the challenges and opportunities we face with the technology. We are going to need the aerospace, academia, artificial intelligence, manufacturing, transportation industries, among many others, to continue to help on showcasing where the technology can be applied. We need your expertise. We need your insights. We need your knowledge to build a system upon our collective learnings and failures to ensure that we build something positively beneficial for society in the future. We want to know that our doors are digitally open, so please lean in and help us collaborate. Lastly, we continue to expand on the ecosystem side and want to ensure that that is always open for additional opportunities. And I'd like to conclude once again for having the opportunity of speaking here today and to showcase to our CASI team that uh, the opportunities in Canada are here for advanced air mobility and we look forward to continue to have those digital doors open and available. Great. Um, JR, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, uh, which is actually you know, a bold vision for the future. And um, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, thanks, thanks so much. Um, there, uh, there is a question uh, from uh, Michael Hanna, uh, which is, uh, can you touch base on the readiness of the authorities and the regulations to certify uh, those products uh, and if the developers are currently working against identified certification requirements? So it's really the, the regulatory piece. Where is it um, in relation to um, this whole AAM uh, sector? Mm -hmm. So, Michael, thank you very much for that question. This is where leaning into conversations on a weekly basis with the Transport Canada and NAV Canada authorities on that certification process has been quintessential for the success of CAM so far. We've been building upon the incredible RPAS trials and RPAS work that TransCanada is progressing, ensuring that that knowledge and understanding continues to apply for the advanced mobility space. And with our partnership with Bell here in Canada, identifying where that can expedite on their Nexus program, ensuring that the larger, more complex operations of AAM don't have to start from the beginning, but can build upon those, the learnings come from the RPAS group. And lastly, on the NAV Canada side, we're privileged here in British Columbia to be currently undergoing the Vancouver Airspace Modernization Project, which is re configuring the airspace above the lower mainland of Vancouver and Southwest British, British Columbia. And it gives us an opportunity to work with NAV Canada to ensure that yes, the safety and efficiency operations 
a conventional commercial aviation are checked off, but that we have a space for expansion as AAM technology continues to come online so that that airspace can yet be the safe operations, but also hold an opportunity for AAM to expand. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, JR. Um, I'm gonna ask a, a related question. So in regards to technology, uh, regulations and economics, which is the which is the which is the most challenging of those elements, or is there another element that's 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 more challenging in terms of the realization of uh, AAM as a, uh, uh, as a as a as a viable uh, approach in the future? I'll make a brief comment on the regulation to summarize in comparison to the economic side. We've had the privilege with COVID to really understand how a decade leap forward in the opportunities for the delivering of COVID test materials, PPE, and when we get to the vaccination stage, that opens up new opportunities with our regulators, specifically in the RPAS side. And this has unlocked new opportunities in the ambassador mobility side. So that has become a reduced hurdle in comparison in the past, where there was a very hard conversation to have with regulators. This is a brand new opportunity uh, that's been presented because of COVID. On the economic side, we have the models already and we're showcasing the data that this does not need to be funded by the tax dollars. This is a beautiful opportunity for private capital to come in and really participate in the developing out of this industry. And the one caveat I'd add for uh, an additional hurdle is that on the public perception piece. We know we have to work with municipalities and cities to understand how this aligns with their current transportation and movability goals, not in against them, and to ensure that the public has that opportunity to be involved, be engaged, so it's not a rejection of the technology due to unawareness. So um, do you believe then that, that the technology piece is, is in place, that uh, those hurdles have been essentially addressed and it's more uh, the regulatory and the economics, which are, are more uh, challenging. Yeah, continued, continued. Uh, it's not, we would never say uh, solved out, but the framework and the base for building upon those conversations with the regulators continues to improve. And as we identify these tangible near-term use cases from the COVID side, it's giving us the opportunity to apply this technology where conventional regulatory policy and framework wasn't as efficient in solving out those uh, near-term demands and needs. Okay, um, so there's a question from Christina Nguyen. Um, she's asking, um, how do the criteria, accessibility, um, uh, equitability, and um, I guess maybe DV, uh, I imagine there's like environmental considerations too, match up with other initiatives in other countries' aerospace fields. So, um, yeah, do 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 other um, jurisdictions, other countries, you know, have similar criteria that they're aiming for? Uh, and are there any other initiatives that you're aware of? It's been a fantastic question. And what we've done in designing out this air, air mobility index is really pulling from the incredible partnership from yes, the aviation community, but the public transportation providers, the cities and regions that are developing out their own sustainability and movability requirements and started to apply it to the next phase of where we see aviation and that frontier of aviation developed. The truth is that we have not seen a similar triple bottom line approach in any other countries around the world. The conversation frequently revolves just around the economics or the technology aspect, but we are trying to really put that stake for Canada on the global context of yes, the environment, pardon me, the economics and the technology are important, but we need to continue to have those social and environmental considerations in order to have the longevity of this technology. Okay. Um, one other question in regards to uh, commercialization, how, how close um, is AAM to commercialization in Canada? Where, where are we right now? We are at the very nascent stages. We have, we continue to develop partnerships with the over 330 plus vehicle manufacturers that are developing out different eVTOL, STOL and CTOL platforms. Our goal is to work and bring them into Canada, provide opportunities with our unique technology base nationwide, 
from rapid manufacturing, working in conjunction with the regulators to really have access to the entire Canadian market instead of just a regional or city by city basis, which is seen in the United States and showcasing how quickly we can do that. Right now, we're looking at test operations in Vancouver in 2021, with 2025 being the operation on the passenger cargo and air services side. So that's the goal that we're, we're keeping in mind on trying to work through that legislation and certification by the 2025 timeframe. Okay, thanks, JR. Uh, so a question from Jocelyn Keeler, a uh, very interesting presentation, thanks. Um, by what means might we receive updates uh, on this work? Is there, is there a mailing list um, that uh, interested um, participants can, can sign up to? Yeah, so great point on that, Jocelyn. Uh, at the starting point, please visit the website canadianaam.com and there is a join our mailing list opportunity. We're currently restructuring with our new launch on the public side of CAM for an engagement and social involvement strategy. And this is really going to provide a more localized approach to AAM that we hope to roll out uh, in January of 2021. Um, Jeremy, did you have any, uh, any, any questions or follow-ups um, based on JR's presentation? Uh, any comments um, given your, your background and expertise uh, in, uh, in technology and UAVs and MAVs? Um, well, yeah, I guess it's sort of related to the previous discussion about commercialization. Um, where do you see, you know, if you're looking at, um, you know, our aerospace industry in Canada is, is quite regional. There's strengths in different regions of the country. Um, I mean, what do you see is, uh, you know, this is a chance to maybe, I won't say reset, but to introduce, you know, sort of a really new, uh, a new sector um, to our aviation industry. So what do you see as kind of the, the, what are some uniquely Canadian contributions that you think we can make? you know, to the broader global uh, AAM and UAM uh, markets? What are some things that, that Canadians can, can potentially bring to the table for that? Great, great point on that side. And what we are marketing Canada to the world is a unified national approach for AAM technology. You know, we're really privileged to be a smaller, more nimble market in comparison to what's going on in the United States in the European Union, in the United Kingdom, where there's a lot of sub-regional opportunities that are bubbling up, where we are presenting ourselves to the world and saying, if you come to Canada and work alongside us, there's an opportunity that you're not going to just get access to the Vancouver market, but we can develop a strategy for nationwide application in the Canadian context. And then critically, as the technology develops, have stronger links to the American markets as well. And this is a narrative that's really been resonating with individuals on the manufacturing side, on the infrastructure side. And secondly to that piece, if we can solve it out in the Canadian conditions with the icing, wind, far north operations, then watch what we can do around the world. And this is another opportunity of not leaning out of the challenges from the Canadian weather system, but an opportunity for manufacturers to leaning in. They have the demonstrations proved out in the beautiful Phoenix, Arizona desert weather, let's lean into the Canadian operation side and see what we can really do in the global context. Great, thank you. Um, so let's see, I wanna make sure I'm not missing anyone. Are there, are there any other um, participants who have, have a question for either speaker, either for, for Jeremy or for JR? Okay. Uh, see, okay, looks, looks like, uh, I hope I haven't missed anyone uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, okay, um, great. So um, just um, a, a couple of um, um, announcements. Uh, let's just see, uh, make sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah, oh, so uh, Jairus uh, shared the uh, CAM uh, URL. Thank you very much. So. Um, there has been discussion about a UAV um, design uh, workshop and uh, a national competition. So this is something that we are uh, exploring right now and we're gonna reach out um, to, uh, to our members and our corporate members uh, to see um, you know, what kind of uh, potential interest there is on this. So that would be very complimentary, I think, to uh, the efforts uh, of the Canadian Advanced Air Mobility uh, Initiative Consortium. So uh, just um, 
stay posted on that, but that's an ongoing discussion. And as well, um, we are partnering with the Carleton Mechanical and Aerospace uh, Society, CMAS, uh, on a number of events, and they are planning an industry um, uh, career panel night um, uh, later this fall. So uh, they'll be reaching out to, to casting members to participate, and I think that will be a virtual event. So just, just a heads up on that, that um, there'll be a, uh, uh, an upcoming combined uh, CASI uh, CMAS event uh, related to um, uh, essentially uh, careers in the future. And uh, just, a, just a word, you know, out to the students out there that, yeah, times are very tough, especially, you know, those in fourth year looking at the future with COVID, the aerospace industry is, in, is really going through difficult times right now. Um, but, uh, you know, there are opportunities out there, uh, probably more on the government side than in, in the private sector. You may want to consider also considering you know, pursuing a, another degree um, until this, this COVID period passes so yeah don't don't be discouraged even though the industry is overall in, in a bit of a slump uh, things will come back but uh, you know keep keep on studying hard and uh, and uh, be reassured that, uh, that eventually things are going to bounce back uh, even if things are quite quite good right now uh, it's all about perseverance and, and uh, adapting and maybe looking to other sectors as well um, in this time. So, yeah. So, um, I I, uh, I would like to thank everyone again. Um, our um, esteemed speakers, uh, J.R. Hammond and uh, Professor Jeremy Laliberte, for presenting. And um, I I'm wondering if uh, Jeffrey, if you're still with us, uh, if you could uh, maybe close out uh, the, um, the the presentation, the lunch dinner today. All right. Thanks, Omar. Um, so, uh, I believe I've, uh, started my video again. Oh, there we are. Um, managed to make my way to, uh, to a nearby aircraft museum. And I thought I'd just reach out to you from inside the uh, navigator's seat of this cockpit here. Um, so, um, Jeremy and, and JR and Omer, thanks very much for taking the lead on today's Ottawa branch meeting. It's, it's a topic that is extremely topical uh, when it comes to um, this form of, of transportation of people and goods. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's just a question, I think. I mean, the technology is there. We've, in, in fact, that JR in his uh, video um, had some uh, images of a few of the aircraft that are being currently actively uh, tested and, and hopefully certified soon. So it's a question of the regulatory environment catching up uh, and I hope it won't take too long and, and I'm sure uh, I, at least I share uh, JR's view that the Canadian environment is an ideal one uh, in which to bring all of these uh, moving parts together um, including the technology and the regulatory environment uh, as well as um, the applications and the needs for the technology. So I hope, uh, I wish JR every success uh, and Cassie uh, would like to be uh, uh, as much help as we can be in terms of getting the message out and identifying organizations and individuals that would be interested in getting involved and collaborating. Uh, the same by the way is true of Jeremy's uh, project, uh, his capstone project and also um, the um, the project that Omer referred to, uh, the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute is, is one of the things we're here for, is to help um, uh, facilitate these activities, especially with young people, and uh, to, help, to help get projects uh, through to completion. So we have, um, we have some resources that we can bring to bear, uh, including, um, excuse me for just a second, um, including financial. So um, before we close, I'm just going to close this background and I'm going to launch another one that would be more uh, in keeping with uh, just the final words that I have to pass along to you. Um, uh, uh, Cassie is currently uh, mounting a number of sessions, technical sessions, 
that have fallen out of the CASI Astro 2020 conference that unfortunately um, had to be canceled as an in-person event. However, we are uh, putting on the CASI Astro 2020 virtual series uh, of events and the, the lineup can be found on the CASI website. This is a growing or, or let's say a, a continuing uh, activity and um, it's going to be um, uh, it's going to carry through right through to the end of the year. Yeah, sorry there, folks. Uh, had another incoming call. So um, the next uh, virtual series event uh, is going to be a workshop. It'll be about three and a half hours in length. And the topic is space domain awareness. Um, this is a workshop that's being led by Defense Research and Development Canada. Uh, so there is a strong involvement in, um, in the um, in DND's use of space uh, for domain awareness and space assets. Uh, so this will be very, I think, a very interesting uh, event. We already have, I think, uh, in excess of 125 participants. Um, there, there is uh, an upper limit on the number of participants we can accommodate, uh, although I don't think we're there yet. So, but I would advise you, if you're interested uh, in taking part in this workshop, um, by all means, uh, sign up for it early. You can find the link on the CASI website. Uh, additional sessions are currently in the active planning stages uh, on CubeSats, which is going to be largely um, a student-driven uh, uh, session or sessions, depending on how that develops. Uh, sessions on Earth observation, planetary science, and surface exploration, and space exploration. So. Uh, if these topics are of interest to you, uh, please uh, visit the CASI website or get in touch with us and let us know that you'd like us to keep you informed, which we'll be happy to do. Of course, uh, joining CASI as a member will ensure that you're kept in the loop on all of the things that we're doing. And so I hope uh, those of you who aren't yet members of CASI will, uh, will consider the benefits of, of joining the Institute. And, and I hope you'll see that what you're interested in and the, the priorities you have um, are harmonious um, and resonate with the things we're doing uh, within the Institute. The more we are as members, the more we can do for all of us together as a group. So I hope, uh, I hope we'll find you all amongst our membership um, as the new year breaks, for example, in 2021. Um, thanks to all for your attendance today and a special Shout out to Todd Legault and April Duffy, who are quietly working in the background to make all of this happen as uh, smoothly uh, as it has done today. Um, and um, they'll be with us for all of our virtual events and I rely on them for their expertise. So thanks Todd and April. And until we cross paths again, uh, I hope you'll all stay safe and be patient and um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now.